What's up guys, how's it going? Welcome back to the channel. Hope you're having a great day. In this episode, we're comparing the new 2020 Shelby GT500 up against, no, not the GT350, but its actual predecessor, the 2014 Shelby GT500. This is the very last car Carroll Shelby actually worked on. He worked on this with Ford, and he even said it's his favorite Shelby of all time. Back in the day when this thing first got unveiled, Ford said it was the most powerful production V8 in the world. Also, it can go over 200 miles an hour. Isn't that funny thinking about it? Because now we have the 797 horsepower Red Eye, we have the 760 horsepower GT500. Everything now is just so high in the horsepower range. Back in the day, this was the most powerful car that you could buy, basically, from an American manufacturer. 662 horsepower. Remember, this got unveiled back in like 2012. Back then, there was no Hellcat. And the best part about it is that it used a six-speed manual transmission only. No automatics. You got to know what you're doing to drive this thing right behind me. Also, this was the first ever 200 mile per hour Mustang. The top speed actually hit 200 miles an hour. The 2020 GT500, nope, it cannot do that. The top speed is 180. Technically, this is faster. Someday, someday I've got to test out the top speed of the 2014 GT500. Obviously, this is not an ordinary GT500. This is a pinnacle GT500 you could buy. There is a step above this called the Shelby 1000, but it's not really a GT500 anymore it's called the 1000 this is the super snake model for the gt 500s and in particular this is the signature series the very last edition for the s197 gt 500s offered by shelby american just limited to 50 models this one is number nine out of 50. obviously you guys want to see the engines right side by side compared to each other i think this one looks a bit more shiny let's pop the hood i want to show you this and Close the door. As you know, this is the last model year for the S197 Mustangs, and with that, the body style changed the following year. So this is the S550 versus the S197. This has non-independent rear suspension versus Magna Ride and stuff that the new ones come with. Here we go, opening it up. All you gotta do is find the latch, then lift up. It's actually pretty light, to be honest with you. You have carbon fiber finished all over the place in here. And as you know, we use a hood prop of this car. Kind of, um, it's not really expensive feeling. Okay, so it's opened up. Now let's um, hit those, push those hood pins in. Pretty cool, I love using these. It feels really unique. I've never had a car with hood pins before. Pushing in the second hood pin. This one is much easier to open up actually. Just lift up a tiny bit, find the latch. And here we go. It automatically opens up. Isn't that amazing? No, no Mustang ever has had an automatic hood strut. Here we have it, the engine bay for the 2020 GT500. I love that Cobra right there in the middle. It looks really cool. It makes the entire car look more special in my opinion. The biggest difference as you can see is gonna be the supercharger size because side by side, look how much higher up the supercharger is on the, the 2014 GT500 versus the 2020. It is bigger, so it's 3.6 versus the 2.65 that you find with the new GT500. And plus the finish is completely different than its predecessor. Moving this way, it's got like a raw metal finish versus the polished chrome and the carbon fiber all over the place. The valve covers are also carbon fiber. This again is not a stock 2014 GT500. It is a super snake, so that means it shall be American. They modify the base GT500 they get from Ford and production wise, they say they're limited to about 500 units per year. I'm not sure exactly how many they made, but for this special edition of the Super Snakes, they made a total of 50 and this one's number nine. Cool features I like are the carbon fiber accents all throughout the engine bay. What's funny is that this one has exposed carbon fiber and walking this way to the 2020, this whole support frame right here, it says carbon fiber composite. Different style, right? But right here is where the hood pins connect. So you drop it from any high and it just snaps in. Going into specifics, the 2013 GT500 and 2014 both use a Trinity V8. These were very rare in comparison with other Shelby V8s because it was only produced for two years. Originally producing 662 horsepower with 631 pound-feet of torque, the Super Snake gets upgraded from Shelby American with a supercharger and a ton of other modifications, making them produce 850 horsepower. However, though, you can go a step further. This car has 1,000 horsepower. It's the highest horsepower offering you can get. The more I think about it, the more I realize that 
this has to be like one of the rarest motors for a Shelby because the GT350s have been produced since 2015, right? Well, originally 2015, they had 37Rs and 100 normal GT350s. So total production-wise, they made this since 2016 to 2020 now. And there's tens of thousands of GT350s out there. There's a lot of them. And those all use the Voodoo's, the 5.2 liter naturally aspirated V8. So they sound amazing, but there's just so many of them out there. Plus the 5.2 liters that you find with the 2020 GT500s, there's no way of knowing how many years they're gonna make this car for. And if they make it for like three years, the 5.2 liter Predator V8 would be more common than the Trinity for the 2013 and 14 GT500s. That's shocking to think about. Another pretty interesting aspect to compare is that the air filter with the 2014 GT500 is exposed. Now with the 2020, it's completely enclosed. Whoa, I just realized that. Let's back up. Look how big the openings are with both vehicles. Look how much airflow we're dealing with. Well, so check that out. Now with the front grills on the 2020 GT500, the airflow gets restricted to right here in the middle and the far left side, there's nothing there. And the far right side is where your cold air intake is. In the bottom, you'll find your air duct for the brakes and extra radiators all over the place. Man, there's so much, you can tell how much cooling there is with this new vehicle. That's why on the racetrack, I don't notice any power loss. It just feels like it can go lap after lap with ease. There's no heat soak whatsoever. If you look at the front end on the new 2020 GT500, you can tell how Ford started incorporating the designs of an actual Cobra because on the sides, you'll see the fangs of the Cobra and man, it just looks good. In comparison, the 2014 GT500 has the classic style snake on the side. It's not in the middle like the new one. It's offset to the left. But with this car, the openings are just, they're massive and it's not as pushed off as the other one is. So for example, in the middle, it's just wide open. You don't see those restrictors, those plates on the corners trying to push the airflow in the middle. You kind of see that with just the design. On the bottom, there's no grill. So on the highway, you can get rocks flying in and hitting the radiator. The top has a grill, but originally the 2013 and 14 GT500s didn't have a grill up here either. Shelby American put this on as part of the package. What you will notice though on the front end of this vehicle is that it doesn't say GT500 anywhere. It doesn't even say Shelby. With the 2020, it says Shelby way down here in the front splitter. And on the front bumper, it shows like an engraving almost of GT500. Hey, you know what? Please let me know in the comment section down below which snake you like better. So the older classic style Cobra or the new refresh variant that you see with the GT350s and the new GT500. This one has much harder lines, it seems like, versus the smoothed edges with the older one. One other thing that I always notice is that when I'm walking inside the garage, I feel like the front end with the new GT500, it's just way wider. It just looks more muscular in comparison with the 2013 and 14 S197 GT500s. As you can see, it bows out right here, just comes out smoothly and wraps around the front wheels. This one doesn't, it's completely straight all throughout the car. You can kind of see how it comes outwards, but it's not as extreme. Moving to the hoods, you can tell that the vents on the 2014 Super Snake, they're pretty aggressive. However though, they're not as aggressive as the new 2020 GT500. Look how big that is, it's so big. I can pull this whole panel out, the hood vents, and it just shows a gigantic hole through the hood that you can see the supercharger with. It's just way more extreme. It's built for the racetrack. Now, both cars have 20 inch wheels as you can see, but this one right here, the brakes are so much bigger than the predecessor. And I mean that in the sense that this car has 16 and a half inch brakes. Try to show me any other car within the same relative price point as the 2020 GT500 that has even close to the same size brakes. These are massive. And let's move forward an inch. These two badges, okay? As you know, the Super Snake, it's way more look at me with the signature edition badging, has the flags on either side of the snake. It says Shelby GT500 and Super Snake. Below it, it shows Carol Shelby's signature, and then it says signature edition. This is way more like when you see this car in the street, you'll your eyes get drawn to the badge. It's that big, plus the car is black. It kind of makes it pop even more. With this vehicle, 
The snake, it's much smaller on the side, but again, it just looks more futuristic. This looks more old school and this looks new. Which one do you like better? Let's move below them. Now you'll see a massive side skirt with the new GT500. It's kind of like a double design because you'll see an ordinary side skirt. Then below that, you'll see one kind of like snapped on, kind of like a JDM car. And when I first saw this, I kind of thought that. But with this vehicle, no, you don't have anything close to that, which means rocks fly up into the side of the 2014 GT500. I'm pretty sure that the lower side skirt right here helps with that because from my experience, I'm not getting nearly as much rubber marks hitting the side of the new 2020 GT500 versus like the GT350. Now, I'm guessing that when you're driving fast and this rocks and rubber fly off your front tire, it's hitting the bottom of this side splitter and it's not going any further. Let's keep walking back. The back tires with the new GT500, they're way wider, which is a lot better. Originally, the 2014 GT500 came with 285 tires in the back. That's not that wide. Shelby American put on 305s for this package right here, and I feel like it helps, but with this car, I think you need Mickey Thompson tires because you have so much horsepower working with. Just the way it puts down the power, it's not as good as the new car. And walking to the back, as you can tell, we have way more aero with the new GT500 versus the classic one. Well, six-year-old classic one. This rear spoiler, it's not as aggressive as the new GT500. It still looks good. I like the carbon fiber accents that Shelby puts on for the Super Snake package. This car, it's got a very different mindset than the new GT500, and we'll get into that. Exhaust tips are massive, and they're not fake. They're completely connected to the exhaust system. You have a carbon fiber rear diffuser for this car, and moving this way, badging-wise though, there's way more going on in the back of the 2014 and 2013 GT500s. You have that center badge. It says Signature Edition Super Snake GT500 Shelby. And then above it, it says Shelby again. This is something the new cars has completely went away with. You'll find the Shelby name on the front splitter and that's it. It doesn't say it multiple times on the exterior of the car. Badging wise, all you got in the rear of the new car is a single massive Cobra. Here's the rear wing again. What's unique though is that this car right here supports a gurney flap. So for drag strip driving, you can remove this and for road course use, just put it back on and it gives you more downforce. Moving to the very bottom, you have variable exhaust modes with the new Shelby's. This really helps. If you're being too loud, all you got to do is hit one button and you're in quiet mode. Both cars came with a carbon fiber dry shaft initially, but for the Super Snake package, once you uh, pass about 900 horsepower, you get to put on an aluminum dry shaft. At least that's what Shelby American told me. So I removed the carbon fiber dry shaft for the 2014 GT500. Well, Shelby did, and they put on an aluminum one, and it works pretty good, I think. But nonetheless, both cars originally did come with carbon fiber dry shafts. Overall though, which front end do you think looks better? The 2014 GT500 or the 2020? In my opinion, even though this thing is six years older, it looks more like a Mustang than me. It looks more like an American muscle car or pony car. This right here is kind of European inspired. It looks more like a sports car, a car that can do everything well, go to the racetrack with a road course, and then go to the drag strip. This one's much wider, obviously, but the 2014, in my opinion, it looks more like a Mustang. Now let's move on to the interiors of both vehicles, right? Here we are inside the 2014 GT500. As you know, we've got the classic S197 style gauges. The speedometer goes all the way up to 220 miles an hour. Isn't that crazy? I wish we could hit that someday. But the view in here is really nice because the hood, hood's really long and tall. It makes you feel like you're in a hot rod because you'll see these A-pillar gauges right next to you. Shows you your boost, also your fuel pressure and oil pressure. Pressure. The hood looks really nice as well because you can see the vents directly in front of you. It'll show you the heat coming out of it. You can see a slight blur whenever you're sitting at a stoplight. It's pretty cool. But moving down, as you can see, we actually have a manual transmission. Yep, a cue ball shifter. In front of it, you've got the name of the car, Signature Edition Super Snake, CSM, which is basically like your chassis number. It's number 9 out of 50. Again, it feels cool to the touch which is really nice. I will be honest, sitting in this car doesn't feel very high quality. Um, the materials, a lot of plastic all over the place. This feels kind of, you know, cheap. 
The handbrake feels pretty cool. The shift knob feels good. Um, I, I like the badge right there. But overall, though, just in front of me, it doesn't look too much the part. It looks more like an American car, right? Um, a muscle car, uh, very simplistic. But what I don't like is this right here. If you want to open up this compartment, push in on the Shelby button and it flies back like that. Which, hey, you're buying this car to drive it, not to stare at all the fit and finish issues with the interior. And in that regard, it's really good. The seats, they hold you in. It's much easier to get in and out of this car than the newer Shelby's because the bolsters on the sides, they're not as aggressive. So I can easily just slide in, slide in here with ease. And even though I don't have a flat bottom steering wheel, it's still very easy to live with. It's easier to get in and out of this car than any of the new Shelby's. However, if you got the normal seats that aren't Recaro's for the GT350 or the new GT500, then it'll be more like this. One thing you will notice though is that these seats, they show the code Cobra right behind you, kind of like the new one, right? But what makes this car so unique in comparison is that it's all black all throughout and it's got some nice Alcantara outlining on the sides of the seats. It's just a really comfortable place to be. Moving the seat forward, pushing in the clutch, it's a very heavy clutch. So driving and sitting in traffic, this can get old very quickly. And changing gears though, this is where it gets fun because you're always engaged with the vehicle. Going into first, you hear that clunk sound right there. Each time you shift, it makes that sound. Imagine going full throttle, you're going 80 miles an hour. You're speed shifting into fourth. That's what you wanna do, that's the engagement. Now let me give you a cold start. So clutch in, let's put in neutral, turn the key. Sitting in here the entire car, it just vibrates. I can feel everything. I'm like shaking right now in the seat. Plus you may hear the whoa, 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 whoa. That's all thanks to the tune and the cams that are on this car. Very aggressive setup and it makes it so that when I'm driving the car, whenever I let off the throttle, it'll just pop, pop, bang, bang, pop. I wanna try to hold the camera perfectly still so you can watch how the whole vehicle vibrates. Close the door. And in here though, it's way more comfortable. The way the seat holds you in, I like it. It's perfect for the racetrack. These Recaro seats, they just wrap around you right here at the side bolsters. They hug you. And it's not too rough though, because some cars, when they hold you in, it kind of hurts your back at some times. I'd say depending on your figure, um, this will be really comfortable or not comfortable. For me, I'm like an average size person. So sitting in here, there's no issues whatsoever. And the Alcantara finish on the inside, it's super soft. Versus the other GT500, the Cobra logo with this one, it's way smaller and it's white. Everything in here has white accents all over the place. It's kind of cool because looking at the seat, it shows the outline of a Cobra. You can see it better from this angle right here. Other really cool features are that of the carbon fiber dash. That's a $1,000 option with the GT350s for the same exact carbon dash. It's half the price. I do wonder why, but the steering wheel also shows the white accents and white stitching. The doors have the white stitching on it. And then you have this white line right here. Even the center console, white accents. Here's where it gets pretty weird though. We've got the rotary dial, the same gear selector you'll find with a lot of the Fords out right now. Are you a fan of the rotary dial gear selector? Should this be in a Shelby? It's not as engaging as a massive shifter right here that you're manually putting in the first and second or reverse. This, all you gotta do is turn it on and spin it. But interestingly, you can't spin it when the vehicle is not on. Also, if you wanna shift manually, all you gotta do is hit this M right there in the middle and now the car won't shift for you. However, it will downshift for you if you're coming to a uh, stop sign or a stoplight to make sure you don't damage it if you forget to downshift. The paddle shifters are nice. Um, they, they have a magnesium finish. They don't feel as good as other paddle shifters out there because the travel with this paddle shifter, it's not very far because I'm just pushing it and it goes, it barely moves, right? Look at this. Shifting gears, here we go, red line and bang, bang, bang. As you can see, it's not, it's not really moving that far. 
I wish it felt like you were accomplishing something each time you press the paddle shifter, like more of a click or more travel with it. The way this car is makes it feel like shifting gears is like pushing a button. Anyways, let's start the car. And I wanna show you guys just how different both these vehicles really sound. Five, four, three, two, one, foot in, no clutch. That's one thing that you will notice. My left foot is resting right here to the left. There's nothing right here. Brake is pushed in. Move this way, hit the middle button to start it. And you've got that amazing display. This is perfect for driving on the racetrack. You have exhaust modes, like I was mentioning earlier, normal, sport, track, my favorite. And then you also have quiet, which as you can tell, it sounds very different now, doesn't it? So here's quiet mode again, and let's go back to a uh, track mode. Other cool touches include that when you change drive modes, it'll change the display for the vehicle. So here's sport mode, the display that it comes with. Hit the button once. And when you change the modes, it'll change the exhaust setting as well. So in sport mode, it'll have sport exhaust and going into track mode, it opens up the exhaust. So spinning the rotary gear selector, you'll see a one now. And putting it into manual mode, it'll show paddles on either side of the gear, telling you that you're in manual. So again, here's manual mode and here's automatic. Goes away. I almost forgot we have the GT500's chassis number. So just like the Super Snake, each one of the new 2020 GT500's are numbered. Let's go ahead and turn it back off. So if I turn off right now while it's in drive, this will spin on its own like a robot. <laughs> and then as you can see, there's no manual handbrake right here. So I have to push this button. Well, pull it and it'll, it'll make that sound when I do it. And when I go and drive, just spin this to the right and push down on the parking brake. Let's go ahead and get out. The flat bottom steering wheel really helps with that because it's just, it cuts off like right around here and your legs can just slide this way. Let's open the door. Well, there you have it. Now it's a direct comparison between the new 2020 GT500 and its predecessor when it comes to the exterior differences and the interior differences. This is gonna be a two-part series because there's so much to cover and I really wanted to take the time to focus on everything. In the next episode, we'll take out both these cars, do some zero to 60s accelerations, braking, and some daily driving on the street. Let's see which one is a better GT500, which one's a GT500 for you. If you did make it this far into this video, we're going to end this in style. Make sure to hit that like button. It really does help me out and subscribe for much more great Shelby videos coming your way. I'll see all of you in the next episode.